Hi, Mark. Hi, Bob. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm, it's a rainy day here, but I'm, I'm fine. I know that feeling. Yeah. Um, let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright of Blogging Heads TV. You are Mark Oppenheimer. You write uh, about religion for the New York Times. But that mm. alone is not the reason you're here. The reason you're here is because you've written a Kindle single, I guess. Technically, isn't that the genre? Is that's that that's what they've called it. That's what Amazon has named it. Yeah. Which it's, means that there's, there's no physical book I can show. But if you're wondering what it would look like on your smartphone... That it's a very it's a it's a lovely cover. It it's, actually uh, is. It's worthy of a physical book. No, they did a really nice job. This is uh, the second Kindle single published by the Atlantic Magazine mm-hmm. online, and um, it's uh, it's the length of a long article and priced priced uh, to compete uh, with uh, long articles, not two, books. Two ninety nine. So, what else can you get in this world it, for two ninety nine? It's a steal. It's a steal. There's almost nothing at Starbucks that you can get for that. No, it's so. like half a. It's like half an espresso or something. That's right. And this is so much more exhilarating than half an espresso. <laughs> I would put this at the one point five espresso level because it's about. Tell me if this is too much. Tell me if this is overstating the case. Okay. An evil Zen master. Let us. Let me tell. Tell him the official title. Actually, the Zen predator of the Upper East Side. But is it too much to say it's about an evil Zen master? Uh, I go with sociopathic, but evil would work, I think. I mean, I've been saying he's a sociopath, but really? I think evil, yeah, I think evil is a, you know, if you're going to trot out, you know, theological language on anyone, he's a good, uh, a good candidate. Mm-hmm. He is. He is. Uh, and how did this, uh, well, let's, you want to, you want to, you cut to I'm, the chase and tell them the sense yeah. of his particular transgression? Well, this is the story of Edo Shimano, who is, a uh, now 83 year old, um, Japanese Zen Buddhist teacher who came to the United States in the early 1960s, and I can I can get into the whole narrative later if you want. But the, the basic gist of it is that for uh, gosh five decades now he has been serially uh, seducing, harassing, um, coming on to uh, unwilling, occasionally willing, but mostly unwilling women having sex or Clinton-like sex with uh, lots of them, and um, totally heedless to the effect this has had on their mental well-being, on their Buddhist practice, or on his community, his Zen uh, community at large. And it should be said that he's pretty much the leading Zen Buddhist teacher on the island of Manhattan for most of this time. So notable Buddhists like Peter Matheson, the writer, for example, he's the guy who brought them into Buddhism. Hmm. Okay. And this is a story that I first... um, I was tipped off to it in 2010. Uh, I write a biweekly column about religion for the New York Times, and somebody said, you really should write about this. It's making its way around Buddhist circles. And I wrote a short column, and then women and and men started coming out of the woodwork and saying there's much more, and people, some people were willing to go on the record. Uh, Some people had documents to share with me. So it turned into a much, much bigger thing, which is why I ended up doing the the Kindle single for Amazon. Right. Now... His story starts in Hawaii, more or less, right? Right. It's a fascinating story. He's uh, There's a fellow named Robert Aitken, A-I-T-K-E-N, Robert Aitken, who uh, was a, a prisoner of war. He was an American soldier in World War II, and he was held captive in a Japanese POW camp. And he became very uh, – he learned – uh, and get, became pretty knowledgeable about Zen Buddhism during that time. Mm-hmm. So he comes back to Hawaii after the war and starts something that became known as the Diamond Sangha. Sangha is the term for a, a Buddhist community. And then in the early 60s, he's looking to bring over some authentic, and there's this great emphasis on authentic Japanese Zen masters, and he brings over this fellow named Edo Shimano, and uh, who's a young monk who comes recommended from some Zen masters in Japan. And Shimano comes over and he takes a couple classes at the University of Hawaii and begins uh, teaching Zen meditation along with Aiken. But very quickly it becomes clear that Shimano is, uh, and here's where I use the word sociopath, he's seducing women. Uh, There's evidence that a couple of women he slept with had nervous breakdowns, ended up hospitalized. So Aiken figures, what am I going to do with this guy? I've sponsored him. He's, He's here on a visa that I've arranged. What do I do? And he basically gets him to move to Manhattan. Um, and then there's this pivot point where Aitken could have spread the word and said, you know, he's really bad news. Don't study with him. Uh, but he doesn't because he wants to protect the good name of Zen Buddhism. So he covers it up and, as you know, Aitken figures he's out of my hair, so he's not my problem anymore. But, but Shimano goes to Manhattan and takes over the Zen Studies Society on the Upper East Side, which had been a prominent home for Zen Buddhist teachings, but was kind of moribund at that point. And that becomes his home base for, uh, for four more decades. And, and probably dozens more women. So, mm-hmm. uh, so this started in Hawaii, but then moved west. And in the days before internet and whatnot, um, you could, you could leave your past behind you. If you, if those you are the town. days, those yeah. are the days. Yeah. Uh, 
And and in his telling, he started uh, his his kind of teaching. Uh, he built his following in Manhattan in kind of mythic fashion by just wandering, putting on his robe and wandering up and down, you know, Manhattan and waiting actually, for people to walk up and say, what's the deal with the robe? You he know? actually told me the story, and this was at the restaurant of the Four Seasons Hotel, where he asked that we eat. Um, and uh, As and any wanted, good Buddhist monk would have done, I, you any, know, having taken the vows of, uh, you know, poverty. Right, uh, you know... He, he he likes living well, and he has a follower who came with him at, to both of our lunches, actually, and picked up the tab, a very wealthy financier who, who picked up the tab. And uh, I, I say that for ethical reasons because, you know, the journalist is supposed to treat, but they made it clear we're eating well and we're going to pick up the tab. You were powerless to overcome I was that. powerless to stop him. And um, he told me the story. He said, you know, I just put on my robes and started walking up Manhattan and people uh, just said, what, what are you doing? And he said, I'm here in America to teach Zen. And uh, they started saying, well, let me learn something. So it, it may have been a bit more complicated than that. But, you know, in, in 1960s New York, that's not totally unbelievable. There was this hunger and this vogue for Eastern spirituality. So it's possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, but he rapidly uh, acquired a fair amount of uh, what shall we say cash? Yeah, Doris Carlson, who was the widow of the f inventor of, of the Xerox machine, Chester Carlson, became an early follower and gave him a lot of money. And then there were others, and so pretty quickly, within a couple of years, he had bought a very nice carriage house on East Sixty Seventh Street, where the society still exists. And then uh, in the early seventies, late sixties, early seventies, he acquired a big piece of land that had been owned by the Beecher family, Harriet Beecher Stowe's family, in um, uh, in Livingston, New York, outside this couple hours outside the city. So, uh, and then he began to build uh, Daibosatsu, it's called, which is um, what he claims is the only authentic Zen monastery outside Japan. And he spared no expense, it was enormously expensive, and it has the traditional Japanese architecture, and, you know, they spent like $100,000 just on the gong. I mean, it was, it's, it's, I haven't been there, but apparently it's really something. So he then had two operations. He had the weekday Zen uh, operation in Manhattan and then weekends and long retreats, which would happen out uh, in the Catskills. And so he, he seduced and used women at both of them, I should say, as well as taught and, and brought great benefit, apparently, to, to thousands more men and women. Uh -huh. So he was, he was not without his virtues as a teacher. And but from the beginning, he was on the make in the, in the sexual sense, it seems. It's people who are close to him describe him as always having been compulsive. And they said, that, you know, there, there were all of these periodic blow-ups where women would leave the society. Uh, you know, he'd be sleeping with one woman and then he'd be sleeping with her roommate the next room over. Or he'd sleep with a woman and she'd bring her best friend in to meditate. And a, a few months later, he'd be sleeping with the best friend. Meanwhile, he has a wife. It should be said that he's married. Um and the wife knows. I mean, clearly at some point the wife knows what she's dealing with and they have some sort of arrangement. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so there are periodic blow-ups where he promises the board of directors, okay, I'm going to stop, I'm going to stop, you know, where dozens of people, leading students, um, his senior monks will just leave and the, the ranks of his community will be decimated, you know, so it'll be several hundred people and then, the, you know, a dozen of the top 50 people will leave. And, um, you know, he promises, okay, okay, I'll I'll keep it under wraps, so to speak. Uh, at one point, he promised one of his vice abbots that he would only sleep with Japanese women for the near future because they don't tell. So there was a lot of this, you know, these Western women are always complaining when you do them wrong. Yeah. And the, the Japanese I, women, know. Isn't, yeah. Isn't it true? Yes. Isn't it true? They're so uptight about those mm -hmm. things. And, and so he, um, uh, you know, he'll, things will die down. He'll be more discreet. Maybe he, he, lies low and doesn't do as much of it for a while, but it, it always starts up again. And the most recent thing, the thing I was tipped off about in 2010 was um, an, uh, an affair with a woman uh, that he was having then. So this is when he's 80 years old, and this is with a, a downtown, uh, kind of downtown New Manhattan scenester and indie filmmaker whose name I know, but, but I agreed not to reveal. And she basically stands up at a dinner out at the Catskills Monastery and tells everyone, I've been sleeping with, uh, with Roshi, which is the honorific they use. Mm -hmm. And she actually didn't feel exploited except by the secrecy of it. I mean, she basically said, I want to be above board and I want everyone to know. So that's the latest. I mean, he's 80 years old and still carrying on. Uh, and the name again is Shimano, right? The Shimano, yeah. But, but, uh, but Roshi, what, what exactly does Roshi mean, by the way? You hear it all the time. <clears throat> you know, I... It's an honorific. It's just an honorific, meaning, 
It's like saying rabbi. In, but it's in, reserved for people who have attained uh, some very high level of uh, Buddhist. Yeah, I mean, in Zen teach, I mean, of course, anyone, you know, there's no licensing for it, right? Anyone right. can hang out a shingle and call it and ask to be called Roshi. But in American Zen, it traditionally is someone who has received what's called Dharma transmission from a senior teacher. So there are these lineages that go back to right. Japan, go back hundreds of years um, of particular teachers who then kind of pass down transmission to other teachers. And you can have an unlimited number of Dharma heirs. So you can, you know, be a great teacher who at the end of your life leaves maybe five or 10 or 20 Dharma heirs, each of whom then has your lineage and, and would be called Roshi. So that's how it seems to operate. But there are certainly rogue Roshis who probably haven't earned it. And this kind of informal structure of Zen, you know, it's not hierarchical like the Catholic Church. It's not even as formally structured as a lot of uh, Protestant denominations. Um, did, did that kind of complicate? Did that did that make, make, kind of make it harder to to get hit, to to confront this? Right. Well, hierarchy is an interesting thing in in religion, right? Because sometimes it's blamed for abuses, and sometimes it's it's blamed it, it's it can actually stop abuses, right? So in the Catholic Church, you know, there's a lot of people who would say that 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 criminal priests were protected by the hierarchy, that the archbishop could just sort of move you along and that they kind of were able to play things so the priests could keep, keep up their game. Um, but in the Zen Buddhist community, you know, the problem is a little bit different, which is that there's no hierarchy. So if you have someone like Shimano Roshi and he set up the society and he basically presides over Zen Buddhist uh, uptown New York and the Catskills, and it turns out he's a... Uh, you know, Lotharyo, there's no one to turn him into. There's no, the question is who's going to talk to him? Who, mm -hmm. Who's the authority that can shame him? Mm -hmm. Well, he has a board of directors, but they're all people who, who are his students who revere him. So what happens often is you go back to Japan. I mean, in the early days, Robert Aiken in Hawaii wrote letters to the Japanese teachers who had given Dharma transmission to Shimano and said, your student is over here in Hawaii abusing women. Can you stop him? Mm -hmm. But, you know, and they probably talk to him, but the reality is they can't stop him. Uh, there's no, no one who can sort of yank your license. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the Roman Catholic Church, there's money attached. I mean, they can tell you, you have to move out of the parish. But nobody can do that except your board of directors, and those are your hand-picked students. Mm -hmm. So there's no accountability, which a hierarchy might bring. And there is the question, and it was raised by some of his defenders, of like, what exactly is the transgression here, right? Uh, you you know one of his students I gather is now a professor of psychology at the University of Texas and and he was on the board of directors. Yeah, and, and there's a there's a, a huge question. Um, I, so his name is David Schneier, and I should say, and he's pretty big, I think, now in neuroscience and psychology. And uh, he sent me an email, by the way, in which he, he and I should, there's a good place for me to say this. He said, you know, I was pretty disenchanted with Roshi by the end. In fact, I was angry with him for half of my time that I was living in the monastery. I wasn't a sort of starry-eyed disciple. Um, that said, I certainly got my facts right when I reported that he, his position at the time as a young board member and student was, look, he's a great teacher. Uh, he hasn't raped any. He hasn't raped anybody yet, um, or he hasn't raped anybody, has he? Um, that was the question he asked at a board meeting. Yeah, he was. He asked this rhetorical question. It was like this. It was he hasn't raped anybody, has he? Meaning, like he's not breaking laws. These are in theory consenting. I mean, it depends how you see consent and sort of power relations. But his point was, why should I, I be denied the benefit of his teaching? And, and, and here we should say, right, part of the issue is Zen Buddhism doesn't have a strong sense of sexual sin. That's not a big part of its teaching. I mean, the Buddha did counsel against, uh, depending on how you translate it, sexual indiscretion or sexual, you know, abuse or, uh, you know, you should be sexually righteous, basically. Um, but there is not, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, you can say, according to our teachings, adultery is wrong or you know, certain things are just wrong. And some of these um, women were married. Oh, some of these women were married. Yeah. He was married. Yeah. Some of these women's husbands knew. Some didn't know. I mean, I mean, it's, you know, it's all over the board. So it's, um, here's the point. The point is that even if you're someone who believes that there's nothing wrong with, with liberal sexuality and, and sexual freedom, right, um, you can still believe strongly that if you're leaving a wake of um, very, very, emotionally battered and traumatized women that probably you're behaving badly. The way you're practicing your sexual freedom is is bad. Mm -hmm. And that was clearly the case if he had bothered to look. I mean, he knew whether he wanted to face up to it or not. 
he knew that these women were not things were not ending well for them after he slept with them. Um, in, in what sense? In the sense that, you know, uh, again, I mean, I'm basing this on reporting that I'm pretty convinced by uh, that, you know, some ended up in mental institutions after having breakdowns, the trauma of having essentially, you know, moved into a totalizing community, right? A sort of cult like environment where you have orient everything toward the teacher and then the teacher sleeps with you and then leaves you, dumps you unceremoniously, doesn't tell you that he has a wife. You know, that sort of thing. So they were so, living They were living in a campus-like setting? Uh, a lot, a lot they, of they were, Yeah. So if they were out in the Catskills, they were often living there for a, a week at a time. Another traditional period is, is three months at a time. Uh, some moved there permanently for several years. In New York City, they were more likely just stopping in once or twice a day for meditation. Um, so, yeah, but so some ended up institutionalized. That was pretty rare. A lot more just ended up... Um, you know, distraught. Uh, I talked to a couple, uh, one woman who's living alone in Maine, um, has never been able to practice Buddhism again, says it completely destroyed her spiritual life. I mean, has basically been depressed for a decade ever since this happened. Um, other women's marriages fell apart. One woman left her, her husband and child. She had a pretty good marriage and, uh, and a young child whom she left to go live with him. And then when she realized that was a mistake, she had to kind of figure out how to get her life, uh, back and how to reconnect with her daughter. So all sorts of abuse. The other thing is, you know, according to some of the accounts in in the book, um, you know, so his advance, although he never literally forcibly raped someone, I mean, his advances seem to have been sometimes kind of beyond crude and, uh, and, and, and qualifying as in some sense... in some sense assault, I think. I don't know. You tell me. But I mean, when, uh, in gen my... my General rule of thumb is if somebody shows no signs of wanting you to touch them, you don't touch them. Right. I mean, you know, I'm not an expert on on the law and what's, you know, what's assault, what's battery. But, you know, there's a lot of grabbing people who don't want to be grabbed mm -hmm. and who then feel that they have to push you away and run out the door. Um, yes, beyond crude. I mean, he's not a he's not a uh, his evil is not of a charming, suave nature. <laughs> it's much more of a, uh, you know, grabbing women, uh offering them, feeding them lines that are just beyond pathetic. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that especially, you know, especially in the 60s and 70s and 80s, but in, still today, a lot of people turn to Zen Buddhism because they believe that its practices, its kind of serenity that it will offer, will help them heal from other things they've suffered. So there is a, a pretty healthy supply of women who are themselves childhood or adolescent victims of, of abuse or predatory, pre predatory men, people, or people who just feel kind of abused by their uh, Judeo-Christian background. They just felt like maybe they were slut-shamed or maybe they were uh, mistreated in sort of misogynist ways. And they go to Zen for safety. And so what you have then is the man who they think is going to save them, mm -hmm. who then says, well, perhaps part of what you need is to perform oral sex on me. I mean, there's, there's, and so they're kind of almost shocked into a kind of obedience. And then you can see how they have a kind of psychic break. Did, did he actually say things like that? I mean, I mean, prescribe sex with him as, as therapy? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he told one woman that she should come visit him to help figure out, visit his chambers to help figure out if she was in fact a lesbian. Um, he, um, <clears throat> you know, yes, I mean, he would, um, his lines would be things like, um, uh, you know, I mean, one woman whom he, whom he fondled, he then said, uh, when she accused him of fondling her, he said, you know, she just wasn't in touch enough with reality, that they had different perceptions of reality. And he was, you know, once you've achieved enlightenment, you realize there is no reality, you know, there is no physical reality. And so he kind of offered this extreme relativism that it was only because she had these Judeo-Christian hang-ups about mat the material world that she could even think that what had happened had in fact happened. So all sorts of crude mind tricks. So... You know, in terms of putting this on the, the good evil scale, or the or the or the merely bad bad versus evil scale, uh, how would this compare in your mind, kind of morally, with a comparable thing involving, say, a ballet teacher and students? Uh, <laughs> why do you choose that example? Just out of curiosity. Actually, the the actually the answer is because I was discussing this last night. Uh, and my daughter brought that up as a counterexample in um, describing why she thought this was, it's kind of be almost, it's distinctively bad in her view to do it in an atmosphere of spiritual practice 
for reasons I can later elaborate on if you want. I mean, in terms of her argument, but sure. she, she brought up ballet and, and, and had an interesting kind of contrast. But but but, but the point yeah. is, any kind of mentor, you know, there, there are lots of formal mentor relationships, many informal uh, mentor relationships, and then sheer large status differential relationships, right? The writer and the, and the groupie. Right. It's very, yeah, us writers with so many groupies. It's, oh, it's, 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 yeah. Where do you find the time to write? That's, that's my problem, right? They're banging on the door, yeah. right? You can probably hear the knocking on the door. Yeah. The, um, it, it's something like rock star groupie. It's something like that. Um, except that, but I think it's worse, and I think it's also worse um, than ballet teacher uh, and, and student you know, assuming we're talking that the, the victims have attained the or the partners have attained the age of majority, right? I mean, I, you know, he was. There's never any insinuation that he was with anyone who was underage. And it, I'll just say, for what it's worth, that in his case, these are heterosexual relate. He seems interested in his ideal would seem to be a a, a, a pretty distraught woman in her twenties would seem to be his ideal, based on on the evidence. Um, I do think it's worse, and. In this case, it's worse because so often people are turning to the spiritual master for healing, often from this precise kind of wound. So it's, I mean, it would be a little bit, I'm standing on one foot here as the Talmudists say, trying to make this up, but it would be a little bit like if you went to a plastic surgeon because you'd had some sort of botched, uh, you know, eye lift. And then the malpractice was that, you know, they they made your eyes even worse. I mean, it's sort of, there's a kind of double injury there that they're the people who say they can fix you. And then you come out blind. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not a perfect analogy, but people are often going to him for repair or for healing. And so, and and you make yourself vulnerable when you do that, right? You, you're sort of saying, look, I'm going to put myself in your hands. And the Zen Buddhist path is one that has always valorized a kind of guru model of the teacher. So the abuse of that then is, is particularly galling, I think. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, what what my daughter said was kind of that uh, it was something about how you know uh, with ballet you're in, you're not as as uh, kind of vaguely dependent on the teacher for guidance. Mm-hmm. You know, you could you could you could look at a video and see whether your you know wh- whether your ballet is good, and if and if your teacher says you know here what well, we'll you know do this and it'll hurt less. You can judge, you know, whereas in the realm of spiritual guidance, it's like I'm seeking enlightenment. There's only one person who knows whether I'm getting closer or farther away from it. And that's this person. You know? Right. And and I think, you know, part of this depends when you say is this better or worse. Right. Part of it depends on what how much sympathy you have for people who are on spiritual quests. Right. right. Um, I don't have a great interest in Buddhist meditation. It's not my own uh, religious or spiritual journey or path uh, to the extent that I have one. And so, you know, if you, how bad is it that this is particularly destructive for people who feel the need for Buddhist enlightenment and who turn to that model? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty awful. Um, you know, at the same time, I'm aware that there are people, there are, you know, secularists or non-Buddhists who would say, well, you know, anyone who did a little bit of investigating first or, you know, has a Google bar could tell you that this is part of what could happen if you go down that particular path. So more the fool you. One thing we'd say about that is, of course, there was less knowledge about that or less knowledge available in the 60s and 70s and 80s. But yes, it is true that historically um, you would find a teacher, you would attach to a teacher, and then that teacher was supposed to essentially hold your hand down the road to enlightenment. And so many people, having made that commitment, were then pretty psychically powerless Mm -hmm. to say no, at least in the the short term. I guess a psychotherapist is the closest secular analogy someone comes to you because they're troubled they're totally dependent on you for the the guidance and uh i mean here's the difference though right is that i think most people i I mean we can never say all most people probably have a sense that a psychotherapist who hits on you is a kind of you know is a is a that's almost a stock character of a bad dude right or a bad Mm -hmm. dudette um whereas a lot of people who go to zen buddhism they don't have very clear rules or a sense of what those rules are. are they don't have a strong sense that the Buddhist teacher who might sleep with a student is, is a joke or a, someone to just be avoided. And again, in part, that's because people often go to Buddhism because they like its non-dualist nature. They like that it's not always talking about sin and evil and you're bad and you're a slut. And so there is more sexual fluidity in how to interpret 
Buddhist teachings, and there's a lot more sex between clergy and laity in Zen Buddhism than in most uh, traditions, I think. What, do you think more than other uh, Buddhist traditions? Um, well, you know, it's hard to say because so much of this is is only coming out now. I mean, I have phone calls from people who are um, – one, one person who knows a lot about Tibetan Buddhism who says there's just a million of these scandals waiting to pop up that people aren't seeing because the, the study of Tibetan Buddhism in the West is so heavily dominated by reverence for the Dalai Lama. So people don't pay a lot of attention to what the – the other lamas, what the mi more minor lamas are doing throughout India uh, mm -hmm. and and in Western countries. Um, part of what we're talking about here is the encounter of Buddhism with the West. And Zen Buddhism was the the earlier tradition, and it was the one that brought over a lot of these these guru type masters. Um, and you know, Tibetan Buddhism came over differently. It came over more through Richard Gere and the Beastie Boys, mm -hmm. and that and less mm -hmm. through a cadre of teachers who were often exploiting. <laughs> students. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's too early to say is one way to, to answer that. Yeah. Um, the, uh, you, you referred to the, the, the kind of non-dualist nature or something. I mean, there you're, you're, you're referring specifically to this idea that the, the, the specific dualism of good versus bad is, is not to be taken the way it is in, in say the Abrahamic religions. Right. Well, that's right. And, and that's, you know, there's other more philosophically pertinent dualisms that they reject of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, material versus immaterial would be, would be a big one. But yes, I was but also referring, the one you're, yeah, I mean, I was I, referring to the, to the, you know, good versus bad nature, which is something that they would, that they would reject. They don't t tend to talk in those terms. Um, not so much. I mean, it's funny though. I mean, first of all, Buddhist scripture itself has plenty of, uh, moral strictures, moral injunctions. And in fact, sure. I noticed that this guy, one of them violates just prolifically, which is right speech. You're not supposed to be always saying bad things about people, but this guy apparently uh, has something bad to say about everyone who's ever criticized him. Uh, I mean, yeah, about I mean, the character. No, I mean, anyone who reads, you know, The Eightfold Path or, you know, right. reads about what you're, how you're supposed to behave as a Buddhist will immediately see that, um, that this, this you know, guy is not on the path. He's not on the path. You know, that said, um, I was talking yesterday with Jay Michelson, who is one of the best writers on Buddhism in America and also has, has, been, a, has been a practicing Jew as well as a practicing Buddhist and is very thoughtful on the two traditions in conversation. And he was pointing out, look, um, part of what a, a kind of smart Buddhist knows is that you don't go to a Roshi, that, that enlightenment is not does not mean or does not necessarily mean here's the guy we most want to be like, you know, that the smart, that the, the great Roshi might not have great social intelligence, might not even have great sexual ethics that Jay was arguing that what, what, you know, enlightenment is a particular thing and a Roshi who can take you there is, has, has a particular gift to deliver you to a certain kind of place of understanding about the nature of the universe. Mm -hmm. And that may or may not correlate with ethical behavior. Now, there is a there is an a, a contrary school of people who talk about ethical Zen or engaged Zen who say, well, that's the problem. I mean, the problem is what we now know, certainly in the modern West, is you cannot separate the two. That if you're that, that you you might have all sorts of gifts leading uh, zazen, leading meditation, but if you're also treating people terribly, you're not much of a teacher. So this is a very live question in Zen circles. Mm -hmm. I mean, I should say, in in defense of at least some Buddhists, um, I, I've had uh, some, I, I've done some meditation retreats in a different tradition in Vipassana, at oh. actually at the Insight Meditation Society in uh, Massachusetts. Yeah, and it, it seems at least, first of all, to be totally above board. They really do, they they almost uh, discourage the guru model. I mm -hmm. mean, they, they don't wear you know robes, and they don't. Um, it's almost uh, anti-authoritarian, and there was also a lot of emphasis uh, at the re retreat on uh, moral conduct, uh, including not uh, using sex destructively. Um, well, you know, and I've heard that about Insight before, as it happens, um, and there, there has been, look, there's been a lot of attention to this. Um, I think that I've written the ebook that has done the best job of describing the, uh, who, the man who may be the worst character. <laughs> I've written the best about the worst. Uh, though some would say Joshu Sasaki, who's 106 years old and until a year or two ago still seemed to be um, harassing women at uh, his Zen center in Los Angeles, might give uh, Shimano a run for his money. Um, but 
there has been a lot of attention to this precisely because the problem has been so widespread. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, of the maybe three or four dozen leading Zen centers in the United States, probably a quarter of them have had a, an abbot, a head priest, mm -hmm. who involved in some sort of sexual scandal. I mean, it's really, it's, it's astonishing how widespread it is, you know, albeit with a small sample size. So especially in the last dozen years, there has been a lot of attention to this. There have been people trying to create ethical codes. And especially, you know, Westerners teaching Zen um, often are very alive to concerns of feminism and gender equality and, mm -hmm. and things that the Japanese masters who came over in the 60s, that first generation um, after Suzuki, were not very, uh, I mean, they were coming out of, you know, Japanese patriarchy. Right, uh, and, and of, Zen, and, and Japanese Zen has a kind of authoritarian vibe. Yeah. It's samurai. It's, yeah. it's samurai warrior vibe. And, you know, there, there's there's a lively scholarly debate about the question of, you know, does it really tend, how quickly does it bend toward militarism? Because we know that in World War II Japan, you know, the, the generals and the kamikaze fighters, and there was practiced a lot of Zen meditation. There's also a, you know, there's there's pushback on that too. Mm -hmm. uh, but but that's an open question. And yes, I mean, Japanese Zen is, is very much its own thing. And, and it's very, one wants to be clear that we're talking about Japanese Zen Buddhism. Right. And do you do you think he was at least an, a, a very accomplished meditator and in that sense in that technical sense qualified to teach yes everyone I talked to said that he was um, a couple people said that you know he cast a spell that once that that didn't seem so impressive once you were out from under it which is something you hear from like evangelicals who have a, a born again experience right. in a kind of charismatic cool. setting and then when they you know, 10 years later when they return to atheism, they say, now it all just seems like a joke to me. But when you're in it, it's very real. Um, almost everyone would say that when you're in it, Shimano is among the best leaders of Zazen meditation anywhere. And I'll just say, having meditated with him for two hours and just... Um, this was your maiden voyage as a meditator. This was my maiden voyage. You know, I don't have a lot. I, I have nothing to compare it to, I should say, except that I've met, you know, dozens if not hundreds of putatively charismatic religious leaders. Mm -hmm. And I can say he's way, way up there in terms of his, his ability to relate to you, to make eye contact, to speak to you in a way that's compelling, to make you seek his approval. There is something very, very special about his, uh, strike me dead for using the word, but about his energy. So he knew you were do you were reporting this story and he said, hey, why don't we meditate or something? Uh, it's a fairly high level of narcissism, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he knew exactly. We'd already had our first lunch during which I'd asked him about everything, uh, including, you know, I'd, I'd volleyed names of women at him saying, you know, yes or no, yes or no. Were you with her? Were you with her? With him? I mean, it had been a pretty brutal interview. Mm -hmm. And, um, but he agreed to, to, to sit with me and, um, and meditate. So it, it, it's uh, his lawyer was not pleased by any of this. By the way, he's involved. There's a lawsuit going on that I could say something about, but uh, his lawyers did but, not. But want it's not you conduct. suing them, right? No, 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 no. This is his old. I mean, he was finally pushed out of the Zen Studies Society in 2010, 2011, and now he's suing for his pension. I see. Um, which, in some dictionaries, surely is the def definition of chutzpah. Yeah. Uh, so, you um, do, do you think? Uh, meditative skill, the kind of power of mental discipline it gives you, well, in what senses may it have facilitated this? I mean, you've talked about the possibility that philosophically he was in a place that was beyond good and bad and so wasn't constrained by pangs of conscience maybe, but what about um, the, the things that you have to do is just a practical matter to pull off what he did, uh, a certain amount of lying and, and a certain amount of uh, presumably insincere seduction. Um, do, do you think there's a connection between his meditative power and that in this kind of technical sense? I don't think, I wouldn't put it as his meditative power or those uh, Zazen skills facilitated his uh, seduction skills or his, um, his uh, amorality, his skills of sort of ignoring morality. What I would say is I think they come from the same place, mm -hmm. which is I think that the kind of person who, and haven't we seen this with other charismatic figures, right? That there's a certain personality type who's often exceedingly driven, um, perhaps in a, a manic, uh, you know, a, a, a manic depressive kind of way, in a sort of Churchillian kind of way, but has at his at his height, at or at his or her height, has tremendous powers of concentration and focus that can take you to great places of achievement, but yet that can also bend toward like total indifference to the rest of humanity, right? That can also it's a kind of such it's such an all enveloping 
uh, personality that one has that you can't spend a lot of time entering into empathetic states with other people. So, you know, if what you are is driven in that kind of mono-focused way to build a great Zen Sangha, uh, you can also turn that towards sitting for, you know, a dozen hours at a stretch, which, by the way, is, you know, is intensely painful. It takes enormous amounts of concentration and practice. Mm-hmm. And then you can, yeah, I mean, it sounds like you did it. <laughs> Not 12 at a stretch, no, but I <laughs> But, you know, uh, but then similarly, that kind of mindset, I think, very quickly can allow one to re-narrativize and rewrite um, ethical problems in a way that's very self-serving. They, mm-hmm. they just seem to be able to, to, go to, to go together in some way. Mm. And you said you think he was a sociopath. Um, what, what, what are the... Yeah, I'm using that in what you might call a thin sense of it, uh, not a thick sense. I mean, I, I actually am pretty persuaded by the research that says that... Um, you know the way we talk about some people like the Hannibal Lecter, they simply don't feel morality. Right. That that type may not exist. Um, that in fact, um, what we're really talking—it's really a, a behaviorist term. We're talking about people who seem to um, just carry on with, without responding to moral concerns. And um, so I, I'm making a pretty basic claim. I'm not going in deep into his psychology. He may in fact know the difference between right and wrong. He may feel guilt. He may have a conscience. Um, for whatever reason his compulsion to womanize or his desires and his appetites just overrode any concerns he might have had um, very, very, very easily. Um, he's not someone, you know, it, it, he's just not someone who seemed to care at all in his actions. I mean, I would say, you know, in principle, meditation can give you the power to be kind of unafflicted by your guilt. I mean, it gives you more control in terms of the relationship to various feelings and although in my experience, overwhelmingly, it, 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 is, it is a good thing for people and they don't use it in this kind of warped way. In principle, uh, you know, there are certainly people who feel too much guilt, anyone would say, and they right. turn to meditation for that. So there's no reason you couldn't, you know, use, use that knob to dial down uh, guilt you actually should feel. I think that's right. I think that's right. And it should be said as well that... Um, you know, we're talking, we're not just talking about, so the, the Zazen has to be seen as part of this edifice of practices, which also includes spending enormous amounts of time focused uh, on Zazen, often away from other people who may um, keep you grounded, right? Mm-hmm. So if you decide that what you need down your path to enlightenment is substantial amounts of time away from your husband and young daughter, um, but that you will be a better person and a kinder, more serene person when you return to your daughter after three months. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, you know, that's, um, it's not just the meditation. It's also a kind of a Zen ideology that allows you to, to abandon a really young child for what seems like a lifetime to that child. Of course, in theory, it should also give you the power to resist uh, sexual impulses, but apparently he, he chose not to use it that way. Uh, you know, Right. I mean, the, here I think there's just conflicting things, right? I mean, part of Zen would say that you have tremendous powers of kind of, you know, abstention and continence. But part of it, you know, on the other side is saying that, um, you know, that, that materiality is, is inconsequential or is, is an illusion. And so, I mean, he told people at one point, he said, if I had my way, everyone would make love at the end of a, of a session, a mm-hmm. sort of a week-long uh, meditation retreat. Mm-hmm. Um, now, was he joking? Was he, I mean, his, I mean, one thing you'd want to tie this into also is, you know, these, these spiritual leaders like the Mennonite John Yoder or like Gandhi, who um, decide to test themselves by sleeping naked with women whom they're yeah. not going to have sex with. Yeah. There was something, I mean, Shimano obviously was having sex with a lot of these women, but the idea that we walk right up to our own limits and test our, test our morality, that, that somehow at the edge of morality lies um, sexuality, mm-hmm. and that you can't do one without the other, that, that, that you don't want to retreat from sexuality, that you want to walk right up to it and stare it in its face, seems to be a place that a lot of um, spiritual innovators go. Mm-hmm. Even when, like Yoder, who was a you know a Christian, there was really no excuse for it. I mean, the mm-hmm. amount of lying he had to tell himself, I think, was pretty great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So in the end, I guess in some sense, justice caught up with him. 
Yeah, I mean, it's funny where things are now, right? There's a lawsuit and a countersuit going on. So Zen Study Society finally pushed him out, mm-hmm. and a bunch of board members finally got so fed up with him that they, of all things, were willing to talk with me. And, and you know, it's now all over Zen blogs. If you go to Sweeping Zen, for example, um, although Tricycle Magazine, which is kind of the, you know, the main magazine for the, the Buddhist community, has does not seem to have been very interested in this story. And I don't know, I don't want to speculate whether it's, well, I'll speculate. I don't know if it's advertisers. I don't know if it's subscriber base. They don't seem very interested, although they've done some pieces on it. Um, they don't seem as interested as they, as they should be. Um, but it's all over now, and there's this suit and countersuit, and they're supposed to go to arbitration, and if that doesn't work out, uh, basically he is still living in the apartment. This is all getting to your question. Did he get what was coming to him? Well, he's still living in the apartment that the Zen Study Society bought for him, uh. whose ownership is in dispute. He claims he owns it, and they claim it reverts back to them. He's suing for his uh, pension, which is like $70,000 a year plus benefits for life. Um, he still has students who support him, uh, including a very wealthy one uh, who I think is giving him money. So he's – and here's the other thing. He's not on the internet, right? So like he does it – and it's funny. In this day and age, if you're not on the internet, you can actually proceed having no sense of what hits your reputation has taken. Right. I mean the people he associates with are people who think he's terrific and still want to sit with him. Uh, and yeah. he's sitting – It's a much more all serene over life. I mean get, staying away from the internet is itself probably yeah. an effective spiritual practice. <laughs> Um, it's like not reading the comment section, right? I mean, do yeah. you read the comment sections? I avoid it whenever. Possible. Exactly. And so, you know, sometimes someone will say to you, did you see what that commenter said in that piece you wrote? It's like, actually, no, I'm blissfully ignorant. <laughs> he's blissful. I think he's blissfully ignorant of a lot of it. That, that's, I guess, my final question. Do you think he was shaken by, by, by this kind of come down? Yes, but he sees it through these very simplistic lenses of, you know, a few close friends have been disloyal. Um, a few crazy women took things the wrong way. A few, it's very small for him mm-hmm. in an almost physical way. I mean, this is someone who literally lived in two places, in, a, in an apartment in New York, a, a, town, a, a Zen center townhouse a few blocks away, and then this monastery for decades with only people who revered him, Mm -hmm. uh, would contact only with people who revered him. And so all of a sudden, a few of those people stopped revering him and he got fired. And, you know, I think it feels to him like if you run a company and there's been a kind of internal coup and they decide you're kind of old news and they want a new CEO. But I don't think he has any sense of like the cosmic ramifications for people's perceptions of Zen. Hmm. Yeah. And, you know, how much of that is also that, hey, he's in his 80s now. Yeah. I don't know, but he seemed pretty sharp when I met him. Well, I guess the practice can do that for you. Why did you, um, when you were meditating, why did you go and what did you get from it? Uh, why did I go? Oh, wow. You've really turned the tables here. Um, I, you know, I had always been interested. Well, I was brought up very religiously and then lost my Christian faith. So you can speculate about some sort of spiritual gap there if you want. Um, the... Uh, but I, uh, I'd always been interested in meditation. You know, in college, you, you know, you, you read your Alan Watts. But I'd never been any, I'd never been able to do it when I had tried. Somebody said we well, should do a one week retreat, and I must say, it was an amazing experience, and I've done it since. <clears throat> yeah. And um, and I'm actually, ri- I'm actually writing a book related to this now. But um, it's, uh, it's, I, I guess the, the the more intellectual reason is when I wrote my book about evolutionary psychology, the moral animal. I became convinced that we are, you know, human, ordinary human consciousness is pretty warped in the sense of these basic biases that are built into us by natural selection, many of which are evinced by the star of your show here. You know, he's, he's, he's self-delusional in, in terms of the way he's handling this, this evidence that, that he's confronted with, you know, and that's just very typically human, I think. So I, I'm kind of convinced that we don't, by nature, see the world clearly. Um... And that's the, 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 the Buddha's diagnosis. We don't see the world clearly. He supposedly has his technique for helping us see it more clearly. And I actually think among all the great uh, religious traditions, uh, this part of Buddhism, the meditative part, and we should say for most Asian Buddhists, that isn't part of it actually, but a lot of monks do it. And, and in the West, a lot of other people do it. Um, yeah, it's a, it, it can be an effective technique 
uh, for clarifying things and helping kind of fight the biases that are built into it. So I'm, I'm actually uh, a fan. I mean, I, I should say that, um, you know, I've done some meditation in other contexts. This was my only time doing mm-hmm. Zazen with someone who knew how to lead Zazen. Um, you, you immediately feel the benefits. I mean, the day seems better if you start the day with some meditation. Mm-hmm. And I felt really good after two hours. I mean, the two hours were hard, but then you get up and the day is like, you know, the things really do, you, you, you feel this kind of clarity. And you can, but here's the thing. So you can see why it becomes addictive. Right. And, um, you know, you can see why, like, I mean, as one woman said to me, I mean, I, you know, you'd go away to session for a week and then I'd come back to my real life and like my husband would, you know, want me to do the dishes and I was just incapable, hmm. um, you know, or taking care of a screaming baby or, you know, and, and, but it's not just women. I mean, men too. And we didn't even have a chance they say to they're less, about. they say they're less able to cope with those things. Yeah. Because they, they got addicted to a kind of, um, so I guess what I'm saying is you find a lot of people who say that when they start the day with some meditation, the day goes better. But when they get too into meditation, they become very dependent on it, and they become very, very, very impatient with uh, with profane life. Because hmm. um, I mean, I think for many people, report it actually helps you cope better with with uh, you know. I remember after my first retreat, in the days after my first retreat, if my kids did something that made me made me want to yell at them, I would feel the feeling of being about to yell. But I just wouldn't pursue it. I, this, uh, whereas two weeks earlier, I would have yelled. Yeah, you would have yelled, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I think I believe that. I find that entirely believable. And probably a lot of how you respond to it has to do with, who, with what you bring to it and who you are to begin with. I think people, a lot of the people who went down this path, especially in its early years, were, um, were real seeker types who mm-hmm. were kind of wanting to go all in. And um, look, there are lots of people, I should say, and I've made this point about Scientology and people, the Scientology critics don't like hearing it, which is that every tradition, whether it's Scientology or whether it's, you know, um, Aish HaTorah or Chabad Lubavitch Judaism or whether it's, um, you know, an evangelical megachurch has plenty of people who walk in, try it out, or maybe even do it for a few pretty serious months and then are like, yeah, yeah, okay, you know, enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you hear the stories of the people for whom it became somehow too much, and it was really unfair me to group all those groups together, but let's stick to Scientology and Shimano. Um, you know, the people from became too much are often people for whom a lot of things become too much Mm -hmm. who go too all in with a lot of things in life. Mm -hmm. And those are the stories you end up hearing. Well, it's certainly true that when you're off on a retreat and I'm sure if you, if they're multi week, this is all the more so part of what you're enjoying is just being off the grid. I mean, that's part of this, the serenity it isn't just the meditation practice, although that's part of it. And and sure, it's it it can be jarring when you re-enter uh, the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I actually am very. For me, if I were to, I mean, so Shimano's great critic, uh, the guy who really helped bring him down by compiling this huge dossier that he made available to me, a guy named Kubutsu Malone, uh, who lives up in rural Maine, a different Maine, rural Maine source of mine. Um, you know, he's very, he, he worked, he did Zen meditation in Sing Sing, I mean, with prisoners. I mean, mm-hmm. he's very into what he calls engaged Zen. And um, to me, that would, would be a kind of antidote. Jay Michelson writes about this in his new book, Evolving Dharma. Mm-hmm. Like, look, a Zen of the West is going to synthesize that kind of monastic Japanese sensibility with the kind of engagement that you need in America today. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm eager to learn more. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we'll convert you yet. <laughs> I, are you a Roche? Are you a Roche? Are you in anyone's lineage yet, Mr. Wright? <laughs> uh, I'm working on that. I'm waiting for my transmission. It should show up any day now. I think that's a FedEx guy out there now, actually. They don't deliver on things. They don't deliver. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, listen, thank you, Mark. Again, thank you. Thank you let so me much. show people what it could look like on their smartphone. Smartphone, uh, Kindle. Kindle. The, the yeah, I don't have a Kindle. Any tablet has an, a Kindle app. That does for that matter, you can read it on your computer. There, yep. is, a, there is a Windows Kindle app. And I'm sure a Mac one. And uh, yes. and remarkably, thanks to the magic of technology, if you read it for a while on your smartphone, put it down, open it up on, on your computer or Kindle, it will it, find it, the place you were at on your smartphone. Uh, uh, it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's really, I, I not just because I like talking about my work, but because I'm a longtime admirer of yours. Ah, well, then I could become your guru. We will work <laughs> on that. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. Okay. Thanks so much. See you.